well, so nice to see you and to to have some activities after the vacation and this difficult situation we are living all around the world. But we will try to to do our best to to give some insight to all academics and practitioners in the world of distance and e-learning. So we have still people joining. Welcome all and good good afternoon or good morning or good evening. Because we have we have people from mainly from Europe but also from other places. And I will I will share my screen so we can we can start with the introduction. Well, welcome all of you. Um, and first, first of all, Happy New Year. And thank you for all the speakers for accepting our invitation to for this first webinar, EdenNav webinar in 2021. We will start the, the series of Eden, uh, monthly webinars with this one. And the focus will be about in social presence and interaction in e-learning. We decided to, to choose this topic because it's, uh, despite uh, the model, the, the framework that Terry Anderson will introduce is uh, has some, some years now, more than 20 years, this uh, pandemic situation has uh, put it into place again or mo more than before because many, many interactions now are happening online also in traditional universities. So we wanted to raise this issue and, and present some framework and some studies and some practices related to social presence and interaction in e-learning. And we have four presenters and here you can see the an overview of the topics we will talk about. And we will have the four, well, first a brief introduction about the, the NAP, the organizer of the, of the webinar then the four presentations and some question and answer. And please use the chat for, for your comments and your questions. And we will continue afterwards in the Twitter with the Eden chat, as, as in other times. And the NAB, the um, Network of Academics and Professionals, is um, a part of Eden, of the European Distance and Learning Network. And it is conceived as a network in space. Uh, for promoting collaboration between individual Eden members and to share knowledge and practices. And one of the main activities is this webinar. This is a, an activity that has been taking place for some years. And last year, the, the NAP steering committee was renewed, um, but we, we have clear that we will we, we continue with this activity because it's very, very welcome, the Eden NAP and the Eden chat. Here you have the, uh, the current steering committee members, and this webinar is co-organized by Francesca Amenduni and, and me, Ines Gil Jaurena, and we will be moderating. So let's go uh, directly to the first presentation, and we have Terry Anderson, who is a very well-known uh, um, academic in the distance education field, and he's also a member of Eden, Eden Senior Fellow, and he has uh, been working at Athabasca University in Canada and also related to, to different initiatives such as the, the IRODL journal. And Terry, when, when you want, it's a pleasure to have you here. Great. Well, thank you, Ines, for this opportunity. And thank you, so many people. I'm really quite thrilled. Um, now, if I can just find my PowerPoint slides here, well, there we go. Okay, so um, hopefully you can see uh, this opening screen introduction to the community of inquiry model. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm really glad to be able to talk about the COI model, um, although I must confess right off the bat that, uh, that as I've gotten more into mass distance education, I've seen some limitations on the community of inquiry model. So um, 
So I will uh, introduce it, and then uh, I will just briefly uh, end by uh, talking about what, uh, what I think some of the challenges uh, are with the, the, the COI model. So let me uh, go to the next slide. And uh, first of all, what it, the, the community of inquiry is a model, and you've all seen drawings and illustrations of models. And the value of them isn't that they explain everything, but they make it so it's intuitive so that a person can get, oh yeah, here's the various elements that are interacting in, in a complex situation. And I think that's one of the strengths of the COI model is it isn't that sometimes these research studies come out with models with arrows going left, right, and center and getting so confused that uh, uh, even researchers can't make much use of much less practicing teacher. So uh, a model leads to exploration, explication, and its application in a teaching and learning environment. So you've probably seen, uh, if you've been in the field for very long, uh, these three, the Venn diagram of the social presence, cognitive presence, and teaching presence. And uh, this was developed by Randy Garrison, myself, oh, in 1998, 99. And, um, and we published a number of articles on it, uh, on each one of these separately and, and all together. Um, it, it's, it's really quite amazing to me how popular that model has become. Um, it's, it's really, it, it is the most cited uh, um, model of online learning uh, in, in, the, in the, this, this century anyways. Um, it, it's used by uh, researchers and you can look, there's uh, thousands of uh, research articles that have used it as a basis. But I think more importantly, it's used for professional development by uh, faculty developers who, who say to a situation, well, online learning is different. It still has the same, many of the same quality indicators that you have in a face-to-face -face environment, but the context has changed quite radically. And if you look and take care of, of the social press presence of the cognitive presence and the teaching presence, you will have a better course. And, and what we were, we were trying to do was to, um, you know, have empirical ways to verify this, and I'll get into those in a, in a minute. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we, we needed to show that uh, online learning can be a social experience. You got to go back 20 years ago before we had even much uh, video conferencing, uh, much less uh, uh, social media, where uh, distance education was perceived then as being basically a transmission model where you would have perfectly designed texts and maybe videos, but there would be very little social interaction, if any. And we wanted to show that you didn't have to be in a classroom uh, sitting in front in real time in, one, in a common location. <clears throat> and we needed to be able to distinguish between good and poor courses, and we needed a mental model for developing quality teaching. So why community? The, even the term uh, community of inquiry, uh, we didn't invent that. It was just taken from a face-to-face -face, uh, uh, studies. But uh, there is lots of evidence about the value of community. It generates commitment and belonging. It's a building block for future friendships, social capital sorts of things. And it, it, it leads to uh, persistence and motivation. One of the big problems we have in online education, and it was even worse in the earlier days of distance education, was low completion rates. And one of the things we do know is that when, when people become uh, adapted to and start leaning on and benefiting from a community, then th their motivation, their persistence increases. Uh, finally, we're starting to hear lots more these days about the need to have diverse viewpoints and to talk about, you know, we're, we're sharing one globe and we have to, you know, learn to listen to each other, talk to each other and question each other. And I think a, a community is a safe place to do that in or, or some communities anyways. And um, yes, and then of course in COVID times, uh, there's a lot of people who are socially isolated. You look around, we're all in our own individual houses, even in these pictures that you see in front of you. And I think that uh, that, that sense of, of community is, has been denied to many of us in COVID times. So how does the, the model work? Uh, there's the big three, social presence, cognitive teaching presence. And then we developed what we call design elements or sort of the major features of it. And, uh, and then we finally uh, got to, as you'll see in the next slide, um, for each one of them, we developed indicators. And this is just an example. This is social presence. 
And we talked about three kind of larger groupings, cohesiveness, where we're talking about a group as a, as a group. So we talk about us and we, and we use uh, emphatics and salutations, uh, high, high class members, that sort of thing. And then we looked for interactive behaviors where they were picking up on a thread from somebody else or quoting their, somebody else's messages. Again, these were originally developed for uh, a computer conference async text-based environment. And they have been uh, updated for more real-time uh, interaction as well, as well as for use in classrooms and in face-to-face -face classrooms as well. And then affective behaviors, uh, expressing emotion, humor, uh, self-closure. So we went through for each of the three uh, social, uh, cognitive and teaching presence. And do note that we always talked from the beginning about teaching presence, not teacher presence, because we felt like uh, the community members start to teach each other as well. And uh, that sometimes they're formally requested to do so. And sometimes they just do it uh, informally. Um, the, 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 one of the challenges we had was trying to measure this with the naive assumption that all the interaction was now laid out there in text uh, through the interactions and in, in a threaded discussion, that, which was the medium that we were using when we developed this. My medium. Uh, I, I say naive because really we know that learning doesn't only happen in what you punch into the t computer conferencing. It, it happens when you're studying for a test, when you're talking informally, when you're on Facebook and other social media. Of course, nobody was in those days, so it made it uh, simpler. But uh, we had a challenge because it's really hard to, uh, something like uh, one of the indicators of social presence is use of humor. And trying to find a joke that everyone thinks is funny is is really challenging. I mean, when we were after, you know, replication and being able to get uh, to, to get it so that we had consistent uh, marking was, was really challenging. And so it, it, it was helped a lot by uh, uh, scholars who developed a, a, a student response so that they had to uh, use a Likert scale survey uh, to uh, to look at each of these elements and give a, a one to four um, uh, uh, rate whether the instructor clearly communicated important co course topics, et cetera, et cetera. So th that, that gave us a, an instrument that was uh, certainly much easier to use to assess the community of inquiry. It can be used by teachers or by researchers. Um, this is, uh, 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 what am I, um, but the, <clears throat> The, uh, the big problem, one of my, my biggest problem with the community of inquiry model is it is a constructivist learning model, and we haven't been able to scale them much above 30 or 40 people. Um, uh, so, you know, I've, I know some courses uh, have gone up to around 50, but I think the quality starts to suffer. So uh, the, one of the big problems is it focuses on student, 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 teacher, and uh, a little bit of student content interaction. But in order to scale, we have to bump up the student content interaction. And that was done through MOOCs where a teacher would often record on video. And then what used to be student-teacher uh, interaction between, became student content interaction where the content was the recorded voice of the teacher. So, um, and, and there's, there's other ways, uh, this was from an article that Randy Garrison and I wrote where we talked about uh, the need for a uh, teacher to content interaction and content interacting with other content. We see that happening now more with the semantic web and uh, artificial intelligence where content is updating other pieces of content. And I think we've got to start looking more because uh, what I got more interested in ways to reduce the cost of, of, of higher education. And the community of inquiry model for all of its power in taking a small classroom and making it work at distance, it doesn't scale to the hundreds of thousands of students that, that, are, uh, that are necessary for, for some areas in the world. Um, there's been many people who have written, in fact, there's whole articles on additions to the COI model. People saying, oh, teaching social presence, it's just not enough. You know, we got to have emotional presence, technical presence, communication presence, and a whole bunch of others. And um, none of them have really uh, carried on, uh, really uh, had a lot of traction. 
I think Randy Garrison once said that he made his whole career on uh, Venn diagrams and uh, a Venn diagram by definition can only have three, uh, three characters or three um, components. But the one that I like is uh, introduced by Peter Shea called Learner Presence. And because no matter how good we get those other three, if the learners are not there, if they're not attentive, if they're not motivated, we're not likely to get much learning happen. So I think when you add learning, then you come to maybe a, a learning model rather than the COI is currently mostly a teaching model on how to teach effectively. Um, so, uh, just to end, this is the COI site. Uh, there's many of the papers there. There's the uh, copies of the tools uh, that, you know, it's sort of it's a, it's a central hub uh, for the COI model and I encourage you to go there and it's all open access uh, stuff from Athabasca. So to conclude, it's very wide, COI, very widely quoted heuristic and research theory. It's a simple model, it's, but it's uh, helping to guide but not restrain. It's, uh, it's based on constructivist educational pedagogy. And uh, just leave you with a couple of questions to think about. Does it speak to learning in your course contents? And uh, can you see or have you used it as a way to develop or to research uh, your, your learning? So thank you, Ennis and Eden, for this opportunity to talk, and I will uh, look forward to the other presentations. And stop sharing. Thank you very much, Terry, for this overview about the this so relevant topics uh, you raised, including the the critiques or the limitations of the model, which is still the very uh, widely used. We we ourselves at uh, UNED we did a translation into Spanish and validation of the service to use it in our environment and and. Uh, it's true. It's it's uh, there are there are lately many publications still revising and using and adapting the the model. So uh, and I, I think the issues of scalability is very very relevant. Um, and relating to that, uh, the next presentation is um, comes from uh, my same university, the Spanish Distance Education University, which is one where scalability is is an issue because uh, we are one of the, the so-called mega universities, uh, one of the of the big universities in distance education universities. And the next presenter is Adriana Kitkovsky. Uh, she's a professor at the Faculty of Philology or Language Studies in the Distance Education University in Spain. And she participates in a teaching innovation group, uh, the same as me, we are colleagues in this, and she will present a, a recent study uh, we have developed uh, at UNED when, when you want. Adriana, thank you. So thank you, Ines. I will share my... Yes? Okay. <laughs> okay, I, I, I will start. Uh, well, firstly, uh, thank you very much to the organizers of this uh, webinar. Uh, it is uh, really a pleasure for me to be here this, uh, this afternoon. And um, as uh, Ines uh, just uh, said, I'm going to present uh, some of the results of a teaching innovation project that uh, we have carried out uh, last year. Uh, with the support of our university, UNED, National Distance University in Spain. And the project uh, was called Learning Practices in Open Digital Spaces and their impact on teaching at the UNED. And uh, I want to say that uh, this uh, project is um, um, continued in, uh, in a new project for this uh, academic year. So we are in a, in a project in progress. Okay. So, um, well, okay, um, we are a group of UNED professors, the majority from the Faculty of Education, but also some professors from other faculties, such as philosophy and philology, which is precisely my, my main field of teaching and, uh, and research. So the, the, the main objective uh, of our project was to analyze the, the use of uh, social networks and digital applications by students and their, uh, and their uh, relationship uh, with the uh, UNED's uh, distance learning methodology. 
uh, the aim was to see what dynamics take place outside the, the, the UNED's uh, virtual campus and to see how to take advantage of them to improve the quality of our teaching. Uh, so the idea was to find out from our students what motivates them to use social networks and the uh, instant uh, messaging applications more and more often uh, and to learn about uh, the practices they develop in these uh, spaces. So the, the methodology we uh, used was uh, a mixed one. So first we uh, uh, benchmarked digital spaces as a basis for designing the tools to be used in the, in the next uh, qualitative and um, the, the unqualitative phase. So, um, as a data collection instrument, we planned to carry out an online survey uh, that uh, we were going to distribute through the forums of the academic uh, subjects uh, that, uh, that we teach ourselves. And for the qualitative part, we were going to, um, to carry out uh, focus groups with, uh, with uh, undergraduate and master's students uh, that we plan to do in, uh, in our regional or local centers. Mm -hmm. uh, it should be said that the uh, qualitative part uh, was touched uh, due to the fact that the field work had, uh, had to be carried out uh, in the lockdown uh, due to the pandemic, so we decided uh, to do the focus groups online through teams, uh, which was also an advantage in terms of the confirmation of the groups, uh, as it uh, allowed us to bring together people from uh, different uh, geographical areas in an easier way. Uh, so I, I, I will talk you some of the um, main important uh, results. And uh, from the uh, online survey, uh, we have been able to extract um, some results uh, regarding the frequency of use of social networks, uh, as well as the formal tools of our university. Uh, thus, uh, we see that the tool, uh, here we can see that uh, uh, the tool most uh, used by students is our uh, learning management system, uh, which is called ALF. Uh, below um, is, uh, is WhatsApp. We refer here to the WhatsApp groups that students organize themselves for each uh, academic subject. Uh, thirdly, we have the Facebook, um, and finally, the uh, university's uh, video conference uh, channel. Mm -hmm. and we can say that uh, the use of uh, Twitter is practically non-existent. Uh, non and uh, regarding the, the, the the use proposal, the, the, we can see that uh, with uh, respect to WhatsApp, it is used, uh, sorry, because I, I couldn't uh, translate the, the text for the, 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 the graphics, but uh, I, I will uh, translate now, so at least uh, the most important. And we say that uh, uh, we can see with respect uh, to WhatsApp, it is used primarily for uh, consulting uh, with colleagues and uh, to access summaries, notes, or outlines made by other colleagues. Mm -hmm. And uh, practically the same uh, for Facebook. And uh, in the case of our LMAs, uh, it is uh, mainly used to access course uh, materials, to contact teachers, and to a uh, lesser extent as a communication channel uh, with uh, colleagues. Mm -hmm. and, uh, as, uh, as I don't have enough time, I will be uh, very brief with the results. So I uh, will talk uh, about the uh, qualitative uh, results. So um, the thematic areas so of the, the dimensions that uh, we were interested in uh, analyzing and, um, and which uh, we organized, the, the focus group uh, meetings were the learning, cognitive, and social mm, dimensions. Mm. And uh, with, uh, with regard to the results, um, 
I'm, uh, I'm going to give some, uh, some hints uh, because uh, there is no time to go into detail. And uh, because, as I have been saying, the work is uh, still in progress and uh, I hope to be able to continue with the analysis in, uh, in further work, uh, in further uh, depth. Um, so, um, with respect uh, to AL, our uh, learning management system and other technological tools uh, belonging to the UNED, such as the video class channels, um, it is clear that there is an unanimous opinion among the students who express the disagreement uh, with the way it works. Mm -hmm. There is a, um, it's a general opinion that uh, the UNES platforms are not adequate, and, uh, but uh, it should be taken into account that, as I said at the beginning, the field work was carried out in the, in the lockdown period, and, uh, and we cannot be unaware to the fact that the digital skills of people in general uh, took an important turn or a turn or a relevant progress mm? because the students now spoke fluently of applications such as Teams, Zoom, Google Meet, etc., etc., and they compared them with the UNED tools. Uh, which uh, obviously left the uh, university's technological uh, offerings uh, very, very poor or in a weak situation. Uh, in fact, the, the university, um, in fact, the university had uh, to start using uh, Teams this year to overcome the deficiencies of its uh, platform due to the increase in, uh, in online tutoring session, tutorial sessions. Mm -hmm. um, well, so uh, as I said at the beginning, the, the question of where our, our students are, um, the concern to see how our students interact less and less between the forums mm -hmm. of the official platform was uh, a major focus uh, of our work. And, um, um, and why do students use social networks or other non-formal spaces as a learning strategy? So when we talk about, uh, about AL with uh, the students, about our LMS, uh, the terms that we can find most often in the discourses uh, analyzed are, for example, terms as hierarchy, formality, inactivity, negative interference, Mm -hmm. So, in contrast, in the analysis of social networks, we find many more nuances and concepts which suggest that there are many more things to say about these. Here we can find terms as, uh, such as immediacy, freedom, personalization, reliability, socialization, sharing, non-formalization, closeness, uh, moral support, mm, to mention just a few of the most frequent uh, ones. And uh, in the case of the cognitive and social dimension, um, when we ask how do social media and non-formal virtual spaces facilitate learning, students answered uh, things like, it's all there, mm? sharing resources and materials. Mm? So they value a closer, less uh, formal way of sharing, uh, of sharing materials, sharing experiences. Um, they talk about also about the study partners, about uh, uh, the immediacy, the spaces, as I said, without hierarchies, free, uh, freedom, um, um, and friendly. You know? um, uh, so the technological advantage of social media is always an element of contrast with formal institutional spaces. You know? It's all the time, it's uh, the comparison, the contrast between one and the other, the formal and the non-formal. So students talks about, uh, um, uh, talking about uh, the, the formal spaces, students talks about obsolete, complex, and unintuitive platforms, mm -hmm. while they have simpler spaces that offer greater possibilities for interaction in another informal places. Mm -hmm. and students are always aware of the limitations uh, of uh, of the use of social media, also 
whereas, for example, they talk about oversaturation and the possibility of incorrect or, or wrong uh, information. And, uh, and uh, to finish, because uh, that's the, the time, um, as, uh, to conclude, um, uh, from our stu uh, study, I want to signal uh, that to uh, respect to digital uh, infrastructures, for example, in uh, technological or technological aspects, the, the, our university, uh, the net learning environment, the elements, and the rest of the tools is not very adequate, as expressed by most of the students who are the users of them. And um, as I said before, the technological tools offered by the net are obsolete compared to the rest of the digital applications that uh, they know and that uh, they have on the internet. Uh, so in this sense, we consider that uh, an inappropriate environment de facto expels users. Mm -hmm. Students uh, do not find the information they need in the formal space, so they lose their way in the learning process and uh, they do not find the necessary feedback. And uh, in uh, respect, to the, respect to the methodological aspects, uh, the current digital scene uh, with connectivity, social networks, and the abundance of open information containers is uh, demanding an adaptation of the teaching methods practiced in distance education. In our research, which, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, ongoing, it has become clear that students uh, find it very effective to seek out learning resources and complements outside the services offered by the institution. Uh, sometimes these resources replace the institutional ones, and sometimes they complement them. In this sense, it seems clear that he, uh, the university uh, should adapt its uh, teaching methods to these uh, circumstances, and uh, the process of adaptation is uh, one of the points we want to follow in, uh, in our research. So, as I said, uh, all the time this presentation will be continued. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Adriana, for, for sharing this study. I'm sorry, the, the audio was not very good sometimes. It was going and coming, but the, the, the slides were very useful for following the, the discourse. Um, in, in the chat, there were many people sharing also their experience in the use of different social networks and the LMS and these different spaces in, in their own institutions. So thank you for, for sharing that. And we will move to another case study, and in this case is Irene Charbonneau from the from France, the University of Nantes. And we have invited her because she she presented her in her master thesis study in the in Sweden. She 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 did the master thesis in Sweden, and she presented a the results in the in the last Eden Research Workshop last October and she deserved the Best Paper Award. So uh, we have invited her to share her, her work, with, which is about social presence in a, in a course. Um, thank you, Irene, and your time. Hello, um, can you all hear me well? Um, yeah, I don't know. Yes. Yes, okay, great. <laughs> Well, thank you for inviting me to, to this uh, webinar. Maybe I'm going to start by sharing my screen and maybe I can explain a bit clearer. Uh, is it Stockholm University, Nantes University? So yeah, here you go. So uh, I'm Irene Charbonneau. So I graduated from Stockholm University recently and now I'm working as a pedagogical designer at the University of Nantes in France. And so my presentation will be on social presence in online course. So uh, for this presentation, so I decided to uh, present my findings from my master's thesis, the one that received the best research paper award. And I also thought that would be interesting to uh, open a dialogue with two other things. First is, uh, so my master's thesis was on social presence in an online course that I took as a case study. 
And interestingly, uh, the course designers of the online course uh, started, started focus group in which they reflected on the implementation of the course. And as I had access to uh, those uh, data and those focus group, I'm going to try to kind of see how this echo my research as it was with the same online course. And then I thought that as uh, given the actual, like the news now, it would be interesting to see how uh, my res results, we were done, uh, I mean, during COVID-19, but the course was online before COVID-19 happened. So how it echoes uh, the pandemic. And now that we have a bit more distance, like also I would love to uh, know more about your experience of social presence during COVID-19. So, uh, so um, the study I, I did uh, took as its con uh, context the growing concerns about social presence. So as mm, Thierry Anderson uh, highlighted, this is something that is not new in research, uh, not at all. But for sure, uh, the new context of COVID-19 has exacerbated uh, this, uh, this concern. So in my research, I define social presence very simply as the sense of being there with others in a mediated environment. And I think like now I, that I'm working uh, in the University of Nantes, I can see from the like from the testimonies of other teachers, how teachers are concerned, for example, like the way the first year students in bachelors are not able to create interaction with other students, et cetera. So I think the concern with social presence is giving, is getting more importance. And so in my study, mm, this um, slide is not completely <laughs> finalized, so, so sorry for that. So I analyzed an online course that was offered by a network called UNIP Network, a network of Finnish universities, to international and national students enrolled in, a Finnish, higher, high, in Finnish higher education. So it was offered in spring 2020. And the course focused on global education development from a decolonial perspective, that was the course topic. And so the aim was to kind of explore the education power structure structure globally and locally. That's about the course I studied. And then you can see that my research, you can see the small Stockholm University uh, logo was on social presence and I used a uh, the social constructivist lens. So you will see that I'm not dire uh, directly working with the community of inquiry. So I'm going to bring some new theories uh, in the discussion. Maybe uh, it can be interesting. And so my research was based on observation of the course activities. So for example, forum discussions or Zoom webinars on questionnaires and on interviews with students. So yes. And so out of the 65 students who were enrolled in the course, so it was a middle-sized course, not a massive course, uh, 22 participated in my study. And then lastly, so I was talking about the course designers who started reflecting on the course implementation. So they did three focus group. And the aim of this uh, focus group was really to see like, so the course topic was on decoloniality, but the teachers wanted to also reflect on the extent to which they used as teachers the te decolonial pedagogies, because it was not only about the course content, but also the course form. And maybe you're not so familiar with decoloniality, so I'm going to give a quick introduction. So the idea for the course designers in introducing decoloniality was first to delink with the Eurocentric system of knowledge, bringing alternative system in, of knowledge in higher education in the content that we are teaching to students. And se secondly, they wanted to break down the hierarchies between students and teachers. And finally, the, the third aspect of the coloniality in their practice was to say that the students should reflect on decoloniality, not only in a theoretical way or abstract way, but in relation to their own personal histories and experiences. So those elements is gonna, are gonna be interesting when I will kind of put into dialogue their reflection in my work. So now I'm gonna present some of my findings and bringing in a broader um, discussion. So in my in my findings, I so in the course there was an effort to uh, for students to share uh, 
their identity, their experience, to be open to a dialogue at a personal sense more than at, for example, an institutional sense. So that was something that the teachers tried to do. And what my results showed is that most of the time, uh, students and even teachers, when they were introducing themselves to others, they tend to focus mostly on, like, let's say, their academic selves, their for example, emphasizing their institutional belongings. So they were reluctant at uh, bringing in this personal voice and this individualized voice. And also, uh, I, I saw that uh, they were reluctant at sharing personal experiences and even maybe vulnerabilities, especially in an online setting. And what was so, when I when I uh, worked with the course organizer for Q focus group, it was interesting to see that they identified this resistance among students to personal experiences and to take an individual voice. And not only they identified this, but they explained to me that uh, even themselves, as, as course designers, they were reluctant at bringing in their personal voice and they tend to maintain the distance with students, saying that compared to their traditional course, it was more difficult for them because they didn't necessarily knew, knew the, know the student, etc. And so I think what is interesting here is, I mean, in general, now it was a course on decoloniality, but I think in all courses and uh, even in, in during the pandemic, it's interesting to think about how to bring students to share those personal experiences, but also how to break down this formality. And I think uh, the previous uh, uh, presentation by Adriana Kiskowski, I hope I'm not pronouncing it uh, in, in a bad way, but was also about that, how to create informal uh, space where uh, students can actually share their vulnerability, their personal experience. So that was the first uh, point. Then in my, in my research, I compared a class discussion in Zoom webinars and uh, in Moodle forums. So I compared students' pr presence and teachers' presence. And this is very interesting when you think about the aim of the decoloniality, which is to break down teacher-students binary. So we usually think that Zoom is something that will increase social presence because, you know, you can see the face of the people, etc. And what the, the results showed is that there's no determining effect of this. So in my result, I saw that in, uh, in fact, in Zoom, there was less student presence because the, the presence was inequally distributed and it was distributed based on academic hierarchies. So in a sense, uh, Zoom tend to reproduce those hierarchies and student participated in the way they engaged in the discussion in reproducing these hierarchies. And compared to when we compare it to Moodle, actually in Moodle forums, there was more students present. So in a sense, Moodle appeared as a more democratic space. But something that is very paradoxical is that Zoom was quite positively perceived by students. And actually, they tend to uh, uh, make it even more teacher centered, whereas they didn't really like Moodle. And one of the topic that came out was that Moodle was putting too much workload on them because they had to lead this, the discussion and be the facilitators. So that was about my findings. And then when I started to like work with the course designers uh, reflection, I saw that they also identify this kind of um, paradox because let's say they wanted to create student-led discussion, for example, in forums in Moodle. And that was part of the idea of decolonial pedagogies, which is to break down the teachers and st students binary. But actually when they heard about the feedbacks from the student, we didn't like forum because it was putting too much workload on, on them. They started to think, is it something decolonial is it a decolonial practice or is it something that can have bad effect and can have like, can be seen more as a neoliberal practice? Let me explain you. So now we are putting like, like in student-led discussion, the um, emphasis is on student, which mean that we also expect, like it's also a way for, for teachers to have to, 
uh, engage less and maybe like I mean there's a cost uh, benefit of, of putting the discussion on, on student and also we expect student to be like um, available at any time anywhere but this uh, means that we consider that the university owns the time of the student and they can be and we can see it during COVID-19 where people are expected to do things late at night or receiving information late at night. So there's really this issue of like the bad aspect of thinking about uh, think, uh, student-led discussion or a flexibility in time. And then the second aspect that was interesting is that um, the course designer was, were wondering how to break down the teacher traditional role by disrupting conventional learning habits, because what we can see is that one of the obstacles to, um, to Zoom being something more student-led is the students th themselves. So how to disrupt students' conventional learning habits, but at the same time, recognizing and acknowledging that students also have a need of stability, especially in COVID time. And I think that's something that we we can really wonder about the COVID now because we want to bring in new practices and take this, uh, this context as an opportunity to bring in new practices. But I think there's also a real need to acknowledge students' need of stability in a world now that seems more and more unstable. So uh, I wanted to end this, uh, this presentation by asking you, how did you experience social presence during COVID-19 as students, as teachers, but also in other, any kind of other online interactions, because I think we all have those experiences that seems weird or that we get used to it then, but that can be actually very interesting for me and for research in general. And I will also like to thank you for listening to me. And also if you're interested, so the focus group that I was mentioning uh, will be used for an article that will be written on the course implementation on which I made my master thesis in, and I will have the, the chance to participate in this article so you can follow up. I hope this was clear and I'm, I'm really happy to hear about your experiences and questions and everything. Thank you. Thank you, Rena. I want to tell you that your presentation opened up a very critical reflection and discussions. So please go in the, into the chat and interact with the other participants. At the end, after the Nadia presentation, we will try to read the questions and to open up a final discussion about it. So I'm very happy to present the last the last uh, uh, the last. Uh, Presenter is Nadia Sansone. Nadia is a researcher in experimental pedagogy and technology enhanced learning at Unitelma Sapienza, University of Rome, uh, where she is the e-learning responsible and head of teachers and tutor training. So I leave the floor to Nadia and uh, uh, let's uh, listen her presentation regarding the e-activity. Thank you all, uh, good evening, and thank you for the invitation, Francesca. I'm really happy to be here. I uh, Let's uh, uh, just uh, tell me if uh, is everything okay with my presentation. I'm gonna put the screen on. Please just yes. tell me if you can see it. Yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. So uh, good, good evening again, everybody. Uh, I'm Nadia Sansone from the University of Rome. My university is uh, an online university, so everything we do is uh, about uh, uh, technology and distance. Uh, and that's why in this uh, COVID-19, uh, we did not get too much difference from uh, before because we are already online, but uh, we also uh, felt the difference uh, in the um, in the external context uh, about our university. But um, tonight uh, I will uh, briefly uh, tell you about uh, the very key we use to support social interaction and uh, especially to support a social interaction which uh, aimed towards effective learning. And uh, I'm talking about uh, activities, which uh, in uh, Salmo's uh, definition uh, are uh, models to uh, you know, promote online active participation 
and learning, uh, both uh, considering the individual or uh, the group collaborative learning. And uh, this is because uh, they are based on a, a solid uh, and very strong structure. So they are uh, well uh, uh, suited to, uh, you know, support and promote uh, uh, interaction and uh, effectful, effectful interaction. Uh, we use uh, activities in our uh, online university to uh, support each, uh, you know, uh, curricular subject. So we have both uh, um, online uh, uh, webinar and lessons uh, which are uh, registered or uh, in a synchronous uh, way. But above all, our learning model is based on active learning. So students are actively engaged and asked to, uh, you know, um, perform activities and realize uh, concrete products and objects during their uh, learning because uh, um, we need to give them uh, this kind of uh, concrete goals and activities based on the idea, which we knew already but from the UA and so on, of uh, the effectiveness of uh, on, um, active learning, learning by doing. So we need, especially when each interaction is uh, mediated uh, via, uh, you know, uh, a tool or an online environment such as Moodle or Zoom or Google Meet and so on, we need to support strong interaction because of the distance and of the, we you know from the literature and the many researches of the sensation of being alone, left alone, um, you know, from the screen. So we need to support students to feel the presence of others, but above all, to feel that they have a common goal that uh, they are uh, all asked to reach for this goal, uh, which is uh, also to shift from uh, a, an acquisition metaphor of learning and of knowledge to a participation one. Uh, that is uh, to build together uh, artifacts which are uh, um, valuable for their society, for their uh, community, and uh, to interact with the peers, with the teachers, with the tools, and uh, with the uh, overall context. So we need, first of all, to change our perspective about learning and to use this medium uh, not only to perceive social interaction and social presence more than before, more than in presence and in face-to-face -face interaction, but above all to change our view of learning, to innovate knowledge and to develop uh, crucial skills uh, that uh, are what we need uh, in uh, the uh, nowadays society, also because of the pandemic, but uh, we uh, hopefully we will uh, go uh, through and uh, after the pandemic, we need uh, to uh, support our students uh, to, de to develop uh, crucial skills such as collaboration, such as uh, uh, critical thinking, uh, learning to learn, and so on. That is why because uh, we use uh, activities to support a uh, social interaction. Activities which uh, uh, we can uh, think about uh, uh, like uh, a recipe made up of many ingredients. Uh, first of all, uh, the need for clear instructions, uh, which we need to give as a learning designer, as teacher to our students, uh, instruction about uh, what they are asked to do, what they are asked to achieve together. So about the tools, the timing, uh, the evaluation, and so on. The more an activity is clearly defined from the beginning, the uh, more results our students will reach together or individually, it depends on the activity. Then we need to give them um, interesting and uh, you know attractive uh, sparks, which call which uh, someone called the, the problems, the question to begin with, uh, and then to continue in uh, their interactions uh, uh, when they are called to produce together, uh, uh, you know, uh, a final report, uh, a final project, uh, a, a prototype, everything that we ask them to to build to prepare, not just for the examination, but to feel part of the same community and uh, to support the interaction. And finally, uh, we need to give them uh, from the beginning to the end and during the activity, 
um, effective, effectful, um, effective, sorry, feedback about uh, their process, uh, not just about their learning and their results, uh, but about uh, how they are interacting, uh, how they are collaborating, uh, and how effectful is uh, their uh, uh, interaction with the tools and with the peers. So the presence of the teacher during the process uh, from the beginning with the instructions and the sparks to the end with the feedbacks uh, is very important. And it is uh, uh, one thing that uh, should be carefully designed from the beginning. And uh, uh, here I want to just uh, show you how we implement uh, the activity from the theoretical and literature, you know, uh, guidelines uh, in the concrete uh, reality of our university. So which is a, a prototypal cycle of activity online in the Moodle platform and how the interaction are supported in this environment uh, by the many tools we use, not just Moodle, but also, you know, uh, Zoom or Meet or any other platform to support uh, a real-time interaction uh, apart from the form. So the asynchronous interaction. We begin each small or big activity with a kickoff moment in which through webinar or forums or pre-registered videos or texts, we give our students the instructions that they need to go through the activity and to interact with each other. So there is a first moment of kickoff followed by supported and guided interactions and group and individual work in which students are clearly demanded to interact with each other in forums, or using uh, the same channel like uh, Zoom or any other uh, uh, tools they feel adequate to support their interaction. But this interaction should be carefully guided by, you know, a, um, an inquiry and a, a, a problem solved situation, a case study. Everything is good in order to support their interaction as well as they have clear instructions on timing, on roles, because we also use the role taking. And above all, on the final goal, they have to reach all together or individual, which could be a concept map to be uh, all together built uh, or, uh, you know, a project work, a research project because my course is about psychology, so they have to uh, manage and, and uh, know about the methodology and so on. It depends uh, on the curricular uh, topic, uh, you know. And then there is uh, the final uh, step of the cycle, which is based on uh, the students' reflections supported by the teacher's uh, assessment, but uh, from a formative point of view, we use uh, obviously a formative uh, a framework of evaluation, a sustainable evaluation, so, so students from the beginning to the end are asked to reflect upon their process, their results, their group interaction, and to provide each other um, from an individual and group point of view with the constructive feedback. So we scaffold them to learn how to evaluate each, uh, each other's, but via co um, effective communication and social interaction. So we have a cycle which supports a continuous shift from individual to the group, from individual agency to social agency, from tacit to explicit knowledge, from different kinds of uh, uh, knowledge, you know, texts, videos, discussions, examples, uh, experts uh, coming and giving their, uh, you know, point of view to our students, uh, and also using uh, conceptual maps, visual maps, many kinds of knowledge, many kinds of experiences uh, in order to combine them and help students uh, uh, you know, develop uh, some uh, crucial competencies which we need uh, from a university students and then from a worker, which are about effective communication, first of all, social interaction, team working, collaboration, and also critical thinking about their process, uh, about how they are interacting, uh, which, uh, which is a, a, what is a good interaction, which is a bad interaction. So I'm going to the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, um, maybe this kind of structure I presented to you may seem uh, kind of rigid, kind of strict, but it's not. Because uh, you uh, um, should keep in mind just to give your students uh, 
precise instructions about timing, about the tools, and to support them during the interactions, to be present, to give them feedback, useful feedback. Then you can, uh, obviously, uh, you can adapt the activity, the many activities you can imagine, you can think about uh, to your curricular subject, to your students, their age, their background, to the tools you, you have available to the, to the historical moment, you know, pandemic or not pandemic and so on. And But uh, uh, what you should keep in mind as a teacher, as a learning designer, is uh, this uh, final uh, you know, remark about uh, the learning design, I'm a designer, and uh, which is uh, that learning design is an art, so you uh, should have a passion and motivation, but also skills and preparation to be a good designer. You need time. You cannot improvise a good activity because you need also to imagine possible obstacles and you know difficulties from students about the tools, about the group interaction, conflicts, and so on. So you need to give yourself and your students enough time to uh, overcome all of these obstacles, internal, you know, uh, resistance and so on about technologies. And also you have to prepare good materials, good lessons uh, and uh, uh, good instructions for your students. And finally, you have to think about your role as a teacher and uh, think about uh, if you need uh, a learning designer to help you with the planning. And uh, above all, if you need, uh, and it's obviously like that uh, in an online environment, uh, well equipped and skilled and prepared tutors, e tutors uh, to help you with an activity because it's uh, a complex architecture of uh, an activity in which uh, you need to perform online where you don't get to see your students uh, all uh, around the activity. There is a social distance uh, that you should face. So you need uh, uh, well prepared people in each role of the activities. So, uh, that's all for my presentation. I hope it was. Uh, clear, most of all, and interesting for you all. And if you have questions, I will be uh, glad to, to answer to you. Thank you so much, Nadia, for your presentation. You received a lot of feedback in the chat and also in the question and answer. So we are at six now. Our presentation uh, should start, but I ask to the Eden Secretariat if we can have uh, some minutes to uh, to start to answer some of the questions for the presenters. I try to collect all the questions, so uh, I um, select one for each presenter. So one for Terry is this. One of the best interactions is between students. How do you encourage that in synchronous communication? For Adriana, uh, are students becoming more aware of surveillance and uh, integrity issues? Uh, for uh, Irena, uh, uh, could you please provide some solution regarding the student-teacher inter interaction via the platform Moodle? And uh, for Nadia, uh, which uh, platform is the best for an asynchronous mode of learning in higher education? So I ask you to briefly answer. And I also want to invite you to participate in the Eden chat because we uh, keep the conversation also there after we close the webinar. Okay, do you want me to begin? Uh, uh, so, sorry, the question, uh, what is the best interaction? How do you encourage them in synchronous communication? Well, I think Nadia answered that question uh, in her presentation. It was an excellent way using Jilly Salmon's model of these e-activities. Uh, I, I really uh, like the fact that it's that it focuses on projects, uh, group-based learning, uh, breaking a synchronous group into, into group uh, group rooms, I think, is critically important. And, and I think that if, if you look back in the literature, there is, you know, 20, 30, 40 years worth of, 
uh, study of uh, uh, collaborative and cooperative learning, mostly normed in online or in face-to-face uh, -face environments. But online uh, has some distinct advantages too. So uh, I, I think it all depends on the learning activity in synchronous and asynchronous. But synchronous has, uh, of course, the immediate the power to uh, to to really. Um, uh, allow people to, uh, to 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 interact in a more sort of a, 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 a real time in a real way, um, and notwithstanding the fact that it opens the door for the teacher domination that that, uh, that um, uh, Irene talked about uh, that that the teachers have to get away from just using it as a as a lecture model. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Adriana, do you want to answer to your question? Is your mic okay? Thank you. <laughs> yes, sorry. Mm, well, I, I, I understand that uh, that uh, people worry about uh, issues of control and uh, surveillance, etc. But. Uh, I don't think that that issue is uh, is uh, is the most important, or at least for me. That uh, because what I want to suggest is that uh, teachers should be uh, aware that uh, there is a huge world beyond the uh, LMS and the um, beyond the official resources of our universities, and um, the community activity of the highest importance is importance uh, is taking place in these uh, spaces. So the question, I think, and um, maybe it's hard, it's provoking, but uh, I think the question is not about formal or informal or about public or commercial platforms. You know? and, uh, I, it seems to me that the issue is where, uh, is where the training activities takes place in uh, in all its uh, extent. So um, I think we need to change our, in some sense, our uh, restrictive models. Mm -hmm. the, the classroom has uh, uh, already lost its, its walls. So um, do not replace the walls of the classroom with the boundaries of our LMS. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to incorporate more uh, social networking activity um, bearing in mind that the community of uh, inquiry needs uh, to be expanded by enhancing the cognitive capacities that uh, can stimulate social social networks. And so uh, to bring the study um, the study closer to the students' uh, practice uh, spaces. So I don't have a full receipt, but. Uh, we have to be aware of where the students are and uh, try to approach them. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Should I Please. continue with the, the question? OK, great. So thank you for your question. I'm sorry that I drawn you in theories and I gave not enough solution in my presentation. I think the nice thing about this is that I think uh, the other presentation brought a lot of ideas and I think in the chat as well. So regarding how to improve uh, student teachers uh, interaction, I'm not going to give another solution to the many solution that was given, but I'm going to do an, a bit different answer. I would say that I I agree with Adriana that you need to plan and you need to make sure you are prepared as a course designer or as a teacher. But I would say something that is important if you want to make sure that, for example, uh, teachers are not taking the whole space or to understand well the social interaction that are happening in your classroom. I would say what is also very important is what I would call the pedagogy of the moment which means that you need to plan, but you shouldn't think that it's all about planning. It's all also about being sensitive about what's happening in your classroom and how, what's happening between students. And sometimes we tend to f a bit uh, like um, forget about this when we are doing online education. And that, that would be my take on this. Thank you. Thank you. And Nadia, if you want, you can conclude. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, right, there is no uh, good good answer to uh, the question which was uh, directed to me uh, because I don't do not think uh, we cannot uh, claim there is a unique uh, best platform for a synchronous uh, learning. Uh, what I can tell you is that. Uh, for my experience, uh, um, since now, uh, till now, um, Moodle uh, is uh, certainly a very good platform, but ju not just to support uh, asynchronous interaction, because uh, to this aim, we have uh, many, many web forums and so on. We can uh, just use a, a common uh, uh, a whatever forum. But uh, Moodle, as you, as you well know, is a constructive, social constructive platform, so it supports uh, a very good uh, way of thinking about learning, about formative evaluation, about group work. So it provides teachers and students with so many tools uh, about uh, collaborative uh, learning and work uh, that uh, I uh, I personally, I prefer Moodle to other platforms, but I do not think it's perfect because it, it is also a closed system and it's not so social. But, uh, you know, compared, for example, with uh, Google Classroom or maybe other social platform, it has some advantages when you want to engage your students in a long path, very well structured and followed by a learning designer and a teacher, I would suggest to go for Moodle. But it depends, as Irene was saying, also on the moment, on your students and on the need you are facing in that very moment. So there is no uh, right and uh, uh, always valuable best, uh, answer to this question. Yeah, I like to the pedagogy of the moment. Uh, and also, there is uh, no good tool of the moment. Uh, we uh, have to follow also our instincts uh, and uh, above all, uh, the learning goals uh, and the learning idea we have in mind. So if we need to put the students in the center of the process, uh, we need a platform which uh, uh, mm, supports students in doing this. But there is no answer to this uh, search for the perfect tool and the perfect environment according to me. Thank you so much, Nadia. I think that we can close this great, great presentation with a lot of interaction. And I hope to see you on Twitter. This uh, um, Twitter chat will be based on your questions. So we will we'll use your question to start the discussion. And uh, uh, I want to tell you that you will find the registration of this uh, presentation on YouTube. And uh, thank you for the presenters, to the presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was really nice, your contributions and also the chat. It was really nice, nice insights. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.